verses 15 through 23. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Brittany. Good morning, village people. My name's Travis Garner. I'm one of the pastors here at the village, and I'm uh, excited to be here on this holiday weekend with you. Um, Thanks for choosing to spend your time with us this morning. I loved what Cruz said in the video. Uh, What we have in common is that we don't have it figured out. Um, I feel like I have that in common with the people in that group. And if that's you this morning, if you're somebody who doesn't have it figured out, uh, welcome home. Because that's that's who we are as a church. If you're looking for a church with a pastor who's got it figured out, I can give you a list of churches that you could try out. But it's probably not uh, this one. I'm very much in that boat with you trying to figure it out. Together. That's really why we're doing this series that we started a few weeks ago, and we're going to be doing this entire fall on the New Testament book of Colossians. Colossians is a letter in the New Testament. It was written by a man named Paul. Uh, it was written to believers in a new church uh, in Colossae. And this church, we don't know exactly how old it was, but they were becoming known for their their love and good deeds, the ways that they loved God and loved their community. And Paul is writing to them this letter of encouragement. And the theme for the, the series and the theme for this study that we're doing this fall comes from Colossians 2, 6 and 7. And it's some great verses to memorize if you're if you're into that this fall as we're studying. But Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord... Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. Strengthen in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. That's what we want to be about uh, at this church. We want to be rooted in Christ. We want to have deep roots so that we're not blown over by the, the challenges of life. And we want to have a life that's built up, that branches out, that is significant, that means something. And that's what this study is all about. Uh, In addition to worship and doing this study on Sunday mornings, there there are two ways. Chris has already talked about one of them that I believe will help you and help us together be rooted and built up in Christ. One is joining a village group. There's nothing like sitting around in a living room with a group of people that you can pray with and talk with that can support you and encourage you and sometimes challenge you. And so if you are not in a village group or if you want to be in a different village group, I can't encourage you strongly enough to come to Group Link next week and stop at the table on your way out to get more information about that. The second thing, you were handed a piece of paper, a bulletin when you walked in this morning. Grab that. Turn it over to the back. Thank you, all three of you who moved. Grab that and turn it over to the back. On the back side of that, this is not just for filler. We have something, two things really. One is called the Rooted Reading Plan, and it's something that keeps us rooted together in Christ throughout the week. It's just a daily reading that goes along with our theme for the week. And I want to encourage you to spend the time to do that this week. Also, there's some blank spaces. Uh, When we gather for worship, we expect that God might speak to us. We expect that the Holy Spirit might, might say something. It may or may not be something that I say. It might be something totally different. But I want you to have that space in front of you because we want to expect that God is going to do something and say something. And you might want to write something down that you want to remember throughout the week. And so I want to encourage you to do that as well. Let's pray together. 
God, we thank you for who you are. I thank you for your presence here in this place. I thank you for the ways that you are with us. God, I know that as we gather in a room like this on Sunday morning, that some of us have had the best week we've ever had, and some of us are barely hanging on. And many of us are somewhere in between. But we're here because we are expectant. We're hoping for a word from you. So, God, I pray that as we continue to worship together, that you would speak to us as we gather. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so, I've been spending some time recently at the eye doctor, which is a fun place to go. We were on our, our road trip this summer and uh, camping out, and I woke up one morning in our tent, and my left eye was just like, matted shut. It was gooey and, I mean, I won't go into great detail um, because some of you might get grossed out and you're going to be distracted by looking at my eye the rest of the time. But it was was not in a good, uh, not in a good place and we were gone for a few weeks and so I didn't have anywhere that I could go. And finally, uh, when we got back, I went to the eye doctor and, and had some kind of weird eye infection. So I've been doing Eye drops in my eyes four times a day for a couple weeks and have been a couple times, get to go back again next week. Um, So that's been fun. And and my vision in my left eye has been pretty cloudy along the way. If you ask the people from the first service about the sermon, they would tell you that I couldn't see the clock. And so in the, in the midst of that as well, uh, I had my annual eye exam, and that's always fun to have your eye exam and to have that thing come down on your face. And then um, my favorite questions that I get asked all year are asked of me when I have that contraption on my face, and you've been asked this too, which one is clearer? Is it A or is it B? Is it one or is it two? I don't know which one is clearer. Like, I can't tell a difference between A and B or 1 and 2. And so if you are an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, on behalf of people everywhere, you please just tell us which one is clearer because we don't know. We don't know. Amen? And if you're here this morning and that's you, I want you to know we love you with the love of Jesus. And we appreciate what you do. We just want you to tell us which one is clearer. Uh, I've learned this, especially in the past uh, couple weeks, and I've observed this, and it's, it's overly obvious, right? Uh, but, but when your vision is cloudy, it's hard to see things clearly. When your vision is cloudy, it is really hard to see things clearly. But when you start to see things clearly, you begin to see everything differently. When you start to see things clearly, you begin to see everything differently. Differently. Sometimes this is literal. Sometimes this is metaphorical. Um, so, for instance, this week I may or may not have driven uh, off of a parking lot into a grassy field. I may or may not have had some of my children in the car, and Amanda may or may not have known about that until the nine o'clock service this morning. <laughs> it's possible when your vision is cloudy; it's hard to see things. Clearly, traveling this summer, we drove 6,874 miles, but who's counting? But, uh, but driving all throughout the West, I began to see just the expansive nature of the creation. And, and I was amazed at, at how many miles we drove, and there was nothing other than mountains and, and desert. And it was really incredible. Seeing things clearly makes you see things Differently, More metaphorically this summer as well, I mean, I've, I've had some experiences that have helped me see some things differently. On our trip this summer, I stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon for the first time in my life. And for one of the very few times in my life, I had no words. Believe it or not, I stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon and it just took my breath away. And in that moment, uh, I was right-sized And I began to see that maybe I'm not as important as I think I am after all. When you see things clearly, you start to see everything differently. Many of you know uh, I spent a couple weeks, like got back a week ago from Tanzania, spending almost two weeks in Tanzania. I came back last Thursday night, Friday, uh, in my kitchen. One of my children, I will not name which one, one of my children sipping on a refrigerated glass of cold water that came from our refrigerator, from our electricity, and eating a snack from our pantry where food is readily available was sitting at our counter and said, I'm having a horrible day. And I said, 
you're having a horrible day. You're having a horrible day? At which point Amanda grabbed me and said, okay, off the edge, husband who just got back from the continent of Africa. Like, let's, let's t- dial it down, tone it down just a little bit. Last Friday, <clears throat> I walked into Kroger, and I was overwhelmed. I was shocked, but I was, I was overwhelmed just by the abundance of food, the availability of food, how, uh, <clears throat> how much it was there and, uh, and how accessible it was. I was overwhelmed by that. I was overwhelmed by, uh, by the person in the produce aisle who was complaining loudly to the Kroger employee and saying, I can't believe you don't have my organic whatever. It's going to be so inconvenient for me to have to go to another grocery store to pick that up. You know, Publix right across the street. And I, I wanted to have a very non-pastoral response in that moment, but I didn't. When you see things clearly, There are things that when you see them clearly or more clearly, you start to see everything else differently. That's that's what's happening here at the church in Colossae, the church of the Colossians. There's There's a problem of vision that's beginning to happen here with the people in the Colossian church. And and it's one of the reasons that Paul writes them this letter is he's he's hoping to help correct their vision before it gets too far out of line. There were some philosophies, some some ways of thinking. Scholars call it the Colossian problem. There was a Colossian problem, and they're not really exactly sure what the Colossian problem was that Paul's writing to address. But there's a couple different philosophies, ways of thinking that were springing up in the first century. And many scholars think it was one or both or a mixture of these different ways of looking at the world. It's interesting that these ways of thinking are still pretty prevalent today. The, The first group of people were called the Gnostics. A Gnostics comes from the Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which basically means knowledge. So the Gnostics believed that there was some general knowledge that everybody could have about God, but then there was some really super special knowledge. And if you, if you really wanted to connect with God, you had to be privy to this extra special kind of knowledge. And only if you had the extra special knowledge could you really be connected with God. This knowledge about God was just for some people. Many of you have experienced things like this in church. You've experienced Christians like this. You've experienced communities of faith like this where they say it's only our way of belief that counts in God's eyes. I remember one of my very best friends in high school. Uh, We'd been friends since uh, we were in sixth grade. And in high school one day she said to me, Travis, I love you, but you're going to hell. Real encouraging message on that day, but for her, it was, this was kind of a Gnostic way of thinking. In her mind and in her church, there was a specific way of thinking and believing, and if you didn't think or believe that, you were bound for hell. And so she told me with love, I love you, but you're going to hell, and wouldn't she be proud today to see that I'm also leading a whole church to go with me? <laughs> Gnosis, this special Knowledge. There's, there's some of that beginning to grow in the Colossian church. The other group of people, kind of on the opposite side of that, were called the Ebionites. And the Ebionites believed that, that Jesus was a really good guy, right? But he wasn't really God. Jesus was a, a great guy, maybe a good teacher. He had good morals. He had some good things to say. Maybe he was a prophet, but there wasn't really anything unique or special about him at the end of the day. He was, he was kind of one option among many options, the Ebionites. And so there were the Gnostics and there were the Ebionites. One of the threats to the vision of the Colossians was that people were seeing Jesus as less than he really was. And one of the threats to the vision of the Colossians was that, was that only some people, or is there, there was this way of thinking that only some people are really able to see Jesus for who he really is. And here's the point that I think Paul is trying to make, especially in this section of Colossians. And I believe it has a lot to say to us today. How you see Jesus, who you see in Jesus, what you see in Jesus impacts how you see everything else. When it comes to vision, who you see in Jesus, what you see in Jesus impacts what you see about everything else. And when you start to see Jesus clearly, you begin to see everything else around you differently. And the inverse is also true. When your vision of Jesus becomes cloudy, 
When you start to see Jesus for less than what Jesus is, it impacts your vision, and your vision begins to become blurry about everything around you. And so that's the context for what Paul's writing here in in Colossians chapter 1. I think these verses can be framed up really in two ways. The first section here that Brittany read for us a minute ago talks about the reality of Jesus. And the second group of verses talks about the result of that reality. So the first few verses, we have the reality about Jesus, and then we have the result of that reality. And so I want to read back through it. And and this is um, one of the most powerful, beautiful passages in all of the New Testament. It speaks so clearly and eloquently about Jesus, and there's not really much to be added to it. And so I'm not going to try to add to it. I might point out some things as I read, but I want to reread it. So if you've got a Bible with you, pull it out to Colossians chapter 1 or pull it up on your phone. And and these are some verses that I've got underlined and I would encourage you to highlight as we read. Here we go. You ready? That's not a rhetorical question. You ready? Awesome. Here we go. Colossians, like we're talking about Jesus who was raised from the dead here, right? He's not, anyway, uh, I would be, I'm excited about it. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. It says, the son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, in Jesus, all things were created. Yeah, do you know what the Greek for all things means literally? All things. It means all things. That's what the Greek literally means. It means all things. For in him all things were created. Not just some things, not the super secret knowledge things, but Paul is saying in Jesus all things were created. And in case the Colossian people don't understand what he's saying, he explains it further. In case you're not sure what's included in all things, here's what it says. Uh, Things in heaven and things on earth. Things that are visible and things that are invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. All things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Not just some things, all things. This uh, this verse answers two of the most basic questions about what it means to be human. Two of the questions that humans have been asking since the beginning of humanity. Who am I? What am I here for? Who am I? And why am I here? And this verse answers both of those questions. All things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Who am I? When we answer that question, a lot of the times we, we answer it in terms of what we do, what our, what our job is. I'm an architect. I'm an accountant. I'm a, uh, I'm a teacher. We, we, think, uh, we think about that or in terms of our relationships. I'm a parent. I'm a spouse. I'm a son or a daughter. Who are you? We, we answer with those kind of temporary things. But what this is saying is all things have been created through him. Our identity isn't found in what we do. It's not found in our relationships. Our identity is found in the fact that we were created as children of God. You were created in the image of God. God shaped you and formed you and breathed life into you. That's who you are. You are a child of God. You are a beloved son or daughter of God. That's who you are, created through Jesus. And why am I here? Created for Jesus. You've been created through Jesus and created for Jesus. Our purpose in life, our purpose in life is for God's glory. It's to love God. It's to share God's love with other people. Our purpose in life is to partner with God to help put the broken things of the world back together. All things were created through him and for him. Who am I? Why am I I here? Those questions are answered right here in Colossians. It goes on. And he is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. The village isn't Travis's church. It's not Eli's church. It's not Chris Cummings' church. This, this, This church doesn't belong to the staff. It doesn't belong to the lay leadership. This is the church of Jesus where we're all about following Jesus and trying to figure out what that looks like in our life together. Jesus is the head of the church. He's not peripheral. He's not one of the options among many. Jesus is the head of the church, and we're trying to follow him. He is uh, the beginning and the first 
firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything Jesus, he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. (laughs) All things. That's the reality of who Jesus is. He's the image of the invisible God. All things were created in him and through him. Thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, everything. He, in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body. He's the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So that in everything, Jesus might be at the head. So that in everything, Jesus might be in charge. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but there are all kinds of things that I allow to have the supremacy in my life. There are all kinds of things that I allow to sit in that seat of supremacy in my life. And what Paul is saying is when we do that, our vision for everything else gets cloudy, but when we see Jesus where he's supposed to be in our lives, we begin to see everything differently. Sometimes I I put our culture in that seat of supremacy in my life, and I put this, this desire to keep up with everybody else, right? If everybody else's kids are playing Fortnite, my kids should be playing Fortnite. And if my kid, does anybody even know what that is? Is anybody with me in that? Down with Fortnite, right? Um, the, the kids are like, I'm never going back to that church again. No, uh, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm mostly kidding. Um, but if other people are doing something, we should be doing it too. And I allow that kind of that cultural, uh, that, that cultural picture that, to be in the seat of supremacy. And I try to align my life with that. And then my vision for everything else gets cloudy. Speaking of our kids, how often do we put our kids in that seat of supremacy, particularly uh, in, in a community like this? We put the performance of our kids in that seat of supremacy. And I, I will just tell you, I have been to enough uh, kids' sports games in this area to know that sometimes we are misappropriating our worship. Some of you are like, ouch, that hits a little bit too close to home. But sometimes we are misappropriating our worship, right? Right? And we have put our kids' performance on the, on the field or in school, we put that into the seat of supremacy, and it's clouding our vision for everything else. Sometimes we, we put our image. Uh, we were at a, a, a parenting safety, an online parenting safety course this week for our now middle schooler, which is weird, and I don't know what to do with that, but uh, maybe you want to just completely shut down the internet, the things that I learned while I was there. But one of the things that they shared with us is that kids who are online 10 hours or more per week are something like 56 times more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety because they're putting their image in that place of supremacy, and they're comparing their reality with the the well-curated online image of everybody else. And what the presenter said is, do you know where they're learning that? They're learning that from the adults in their lives, (laughs) that we're putting our our online image in that seat of supremacy. Our opinions, I I put my opinions, and and some of you are probably guilty of this too. Uh, If you've been on the Nolansville 411 on Facebook, you've seen that sometimes we put our opinions in that seat of supremacy in life. And, And at a time in an age where we have access to more information at our fingertips than any other time, We can read more, we can learn more for some reason rather than going, you know what, with all that information out there, maybe I'm not right all the time. Instead of doing that, we are entrenched in our opinions and we're putting our opinions in that seat of supremacy, our politics, our career, our relationships. We're putting all kinds of things in that seat of supremacy and when we do that, it's like we're we're putting that mask at the optometrist on our faces and they are blurring the vision for how we see everything else. But what Paul is saying is when you see Jesus clearly, you begin to see everything differently. You begin to see everything more clearly. And so he's laying out clearly who is Jesus. What's the reality of who Jesus is? And he's saying to the Colossian people, the one thing you must do in life If you want to have a life that's rooted, if you want to have a life that's built up, that matters, that makes a difference, you must see Jesus clearly. And then he goes on and he talks about the result of that. Just the the last few verses here. 
the reality of Jesus and the result of that reality. Verse 21 He says, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Because of the reality of who Jesus is, because of the reality of the love of Jesus, because of the vision that we can see in Jesus, we're now able to see things clearly and to be connected with God in a way that wasn't possible without him. The reality of Jesus, the reality of Jesus, and the reality of what's possible because of who Jesus is. Now, Paul goes on. It's the last thing I'll read. He says, If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, And do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Continue in your faith. Hold firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. What's it look like to see Jesus clearly and to see everything else differently as a result? What's it look like to put Jesus in that seat of supremacy and then let everything else in life flow from there? It looks like Pastor Jacob, who I met in the Ingrichini village in Tanzania. Pastor Jacob began to see Jesus clearly, and as a result, he and his family, in response to the goodness of God, they started a worship service underneath a tree outside of their home. And as a result, they've gathered 80 people. They met this morning in a church there. He's now a pastor of a church, and because of that, other people are beginning to see Jesus clearly and see their lives differently. It looks like Jay Renfro. Jay Renfro helped us start our community garden on our property this week. Jay didn't grow up as a gardener, but Jay began to see Jesus clearly. And when Jay began to see Jesus clearly, he began to see things differently. He began to see that there are issues of food access, and he wanted to do something about that. And so as a result, people are now seeing things more clearly through Jay seeing Jesus more clearly. Or Lisa Smoot. Who knows Lisa Smoot? Lisa, are you here? Lisa's at the beach. (laughs) Hello on Facebook Live, Lisa Smoot. Right, so over 15 million people have seen Lisa Smoot's video of dancing on I-65 in a traffic gridlock. It's been shared hundreds of thousands of times because Lisa is simply being Lisa, and Lisa is filled with the joy of the Lord, and she got out of her car in response to who Jesus is to her, and she was like, I'm gonna make the best out of this situation, and she started dancing on I-65, and now 15 million people have seen it. In addition to that, not only have people seen that, but she's heard from thousands of people literally all over the country who've said to her, you have no idea how much hope you gave me in this video. I was on the brink of something destructive in my life, and because I saw this, and I'm wondering what's wrong with you, (laughs) right? (laughs) Now I'm starting to go down a different path. People have asked Lisa, what is it that you're smoking to make you get out and dance on the interstate? And she's able to say, I'm smoking the joy of Jesus, (laughs) right? She sees Jesus more clearly, and because she sees Jesus clearly, she sees everything else differently, and as a result, people around her are beginning to see things differently as well. That's what Paul is saying here through and through and through. When you don't see things clearly, you don't see things the way that God intended for you to see them, but when you begin to see things clearly, everything begins to look different. And when you see Jesus clearly, you start to see the things of the world the way you were intended to see them. So we're going to come to this communion table in just a minute. Again, I can't see the clock. I have no idea what time it is. Don't tell me. But we're going to come to this communion table. And the reason we share in communion every week is because this for us is a vision reset. Every week this resets our vision. It's not about the sermon. Like there are weeks where I just drop a complete bomb in here and I walk away and I'm like, well, that was... That was something, right? There are weeks where uh, the band plays a wrong chord or Eli might break a string on the guitar and we kind of walk away and laugh. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's not about us. It's not about what I say. It's not about what the band plays. 
We're here because of Jesus so that he might have the supremacy. And we come to this communion table every week to be reminded who we are. To be reminded of of who Jesus is and who we are as a result of that. It resets our vision. And so as we're getting ready to to come to the communion table this week, I want to ask you, what would it look like for you in your life to see Jesus more and more and more clearly? What might happen as a result of that for you? What are the things that you need to let go of? What are the things that you need to remove from your eyes? What are, what are the things that might help you see Jesus more and more and more clearly? And what might happen as a result of that in your life?